Hi, friends. In this episode, we have a special guest. He's an immigration attorney himself. He practices only asylum. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian Manning in a few seconds. All right. Well, we're so excited to have you on board on this, today's episode, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure. We're glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, we actually got connected by a fellow friend and colleague also in immigration law. And so it's always just great to um, see how we can help each other. And most importantly, ultimately, the clients, the applicants out here in the community. Today's episode is a common reason. So I think we're going to have like top five reasons why asylum cases are rejected, which is different than denial. Yeah, exactly. So to distinguish first between those two, so there's no confusion. When I say rejection today, I think what you had in mind, John, is we're talking about when someone sends in their asylum application and the office that receives it says, nope, we're not even going to take it, and they send it back to you. That doesn't mean that your case is being denied. It just means you basically got to start over. You've got to try to fix whatever it is that they said was wrong. And to be honest with you, sometimes they say something's wrong even when there's nothing wrong. In any event, you've got to resend it. So that's a pain and it can be time consuming and it slows down you know, your asylum case, but it also slows down uh, getting a work permit based on a pending asylum case. So you don't want that to happen. So yeah, we'll talk about five things that can lead to that. And then maybe some other time we can talk about uh, denial reasons, substantive reasons why people's asylum claims get, uh, get denied. Sure. And sorry for, sorry, Brian, I meant to introduce with your background, uh, oh. Brian Manning, before he went to private practice, he worked uh, abroad with the Department of State. And he also, after that, he became a USCIS officer, interviewing officer for asylum cases. So this has definitely added value to his clients because I don't know much about asylum in respect to the government side. So that's great to uh, for you to have that background. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was a diplomat for about eight and a half years. And in that role, I did some of the consular or visa work, you know, doing the interviews when people need a visa to come to the United States. And then I switched over to USCIS, which is the part of the Department of Homeland Security that handles certain types of asylum cases, doing just asylum law as a private asylum lawyer. Yeah, and you, you've been plenty busy, so that's great. You have plenty of people to help out, and we wish we could help everyone, but I know it's difficult it's depending on the, the their, that person's facts, if it meets the, you know or exceeds the standard, right? But going to the reason why we wanted to have this topic uh, top reasons for rejection is because recently there was a USCS policy that, or under President Trump, they're basically rejecting, I would say what, like pretty much 100% of people who didn't put the letters N for slash A, even if the question did not apply to them. Exactly. It was, it was a huge pain, John. Um, the asylum application was long, right? It's like nine pages of, of actual questions and then a couple additional pages. And there's a lot of questions that will not apply to a, a given person. Like, so for example, if you know, there's a question that says, do you have children? And then you mark no, right? Well, below that, there's a bunch of question about the applicant's children. And so naturally you wouldn't think that you would need to go through and somehow answer all those questions about the child if you don't have a child. But what was happening is if someone left that blank, if they didn't put either not applicable or in slash a standing for not applicable, then um, USCIS would reject it. And they would send it back to the person and say, oh, sorry, you did not fill out the application form correctly. So we're going to reject it. Um, and I mean, to be honest with you, this was just a, a way for them to make people's lives harder. There was a time when um, the administration uh, just didn't want people to get asylum and they wanted to make it as hard as possible. And by rejecting these, you know, a lot of people would give up. They would try it several times, even in some cases, and finally just think it was too hard and give up. So that was a policy. Thankfully, that was changed um, by the Biden administration. And they don't do that now. Like if you send an application that has a few marks, a few spots that are left blank, they're, 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 they shouldn't uh, at least reject it on that basis. But to be honest with you, I still advise people to, to do it, to still put in A, in slash A, um, because you never know. USCIS policies change 
all the time. And something could, that, that could change again and they could start rejecting people because of it. And your application might not actually get considered until something like that happens. And so to be on the safe side, I recommend that people do in all of the blanks, even if it seems ridiculous to have to do so, to go ahead and put not applicable or, or in slash A. Thanks, thanks, Brian, for filling us in there. There's a there's a couple of things I like to mention. One on the legal part, the legal requirement for, to file this. You have most people don't know this, Brian. Obviously, you know the one year rule, but you know if someone entered in January first, twenty twenty, your application has to be submitted, received by the government within the one year of January first, twenty twenty. So latest December thirty first, twenty twenty one. So if I got that correct, or December 31st, 2020, see, getting all my dates all mixed up. So <laughs> yeah, so that's 365, that's 365th day. So this new settlement, the reason we're mentioning this friends today is because recently, um, last week, four days ago, there's a settlement agreement between USAIS and the uh, and Department of Homeland, well, yeah, and the plaintiffs about the rejection on the blank spaces. So anyone I see here in my, my memo here, any people that were affected by this who tried to file within the one year and thought they were out of luck, now you have until July 20th, 2022. So next year. But if I were you, I would get in touch with a lawyer like Brian Manning and make sure you fill out everything correctly. And of course, it's not just about answering the blanks, but making sure that what your information you're providing is truthful. So that's very important because I know Brian, as a government officer, you had to look into credibility a lot, right? Just like the judges in courts. Yep, that's right. We did. We did. Yeah, you know, John, we said we were going to talk about five different reasons for rejections. Well, that that was one of them that uh, that I wanted to definitely touch on. That was more so in the past, but again, you never know when policies could change back. So do do put in a in in these in these slots, and then to go ahead and, and move along, John. Um, what are some of the other reasons that asylum applications get rejected or sent back to the person with instructions to say, sorry, you messed up, you got to try again? Um, a really common one that I saw when I was an asylum officer was that the person simply forgot to sign the form. And this is not unique to asylum applications, um, but rather, uh, you know, all USCIS forms require a signature, right? On the asylum application, it happens to be at page nine. And to be honest with you, the page is a little bit confusing, just the way it's structured and the way that it's worded. Um, it's not always clear to people um, that they need to sign or if they do, where they need to sign. So it very often gets over overlooked. And then also related to that, this is a, a problem. There's a box that says, okay, right above where you're supposed to sign your name, there's a box that says, print your name here. And you're supposed to print your name like in, you know, write it out in print letters, not signing it in cursive in like English letters, right? And then next to it, there's a box that says, if your native alphabet uses something other than what's used in English, like, uh, then you need to write it in your in your native alphabet. Um, so let's say it's like a Russian speaker, they would need to write it in Cyrillic in that box. Well, people often don't know to do that. Like they don't get that that's what's being asked of them. So they'll write it again in like the English letters, or just not write anything, or they'll sign it in like a cursive English <laughs> signature. Um, so that's something else that's related to the signature that often trips people up. And it's really weird for for people who whose native language is English or like let's say a Spanish speaker where the alphabet's almost the same, they don't really know how to handle that. And they, um, they but they, they should actually write out their name, their full name in both boxes looking exactly the same, which feels a little weird, but. Um, no, that's a, that's a good point, Brian, because some, minor error like that can can cause someone to mi miss the one deadline right because i think well nothing was wrong with my application because you so, didn't even think something like a name is uh that important to and you're correct i guess te yeah so technically the way yeah you're right yes technically the way it works is that for purposes of the one year filing deadline if uscis rejects an application because of a deficiency like the things that we've been talking about um and then you send it in and like if, if they reject it before you've reached your one year mark and then you send your application in after the one year mark um they're supposed to actually use that date from the first attempted filing for purposes of determining what the, whether you met the one year filing deadline as long as you 
send the new application, the corrected application within a reasonable period of time. Um, but that's kind of murky, like what that means. And, and often people get discouraged, you know, when they get a rejection and it takes them several months to get, get around to doing it again. And that probably wouldn't be reasonable. Um, so it's always best to play it safe and try and do it right the first time. And if you get rejected, do it again as soon as possible. Absolutely. And I guess a pro tip, I always think like, you know, if there's request for evidence, the government, the USCIS will provide you a, an official letter and you, not, I mean, hundred percent of the time they'll say provide this letter with your, your su subsequent, um, mailing or your next mailing. So, because I remember that, like if I had, if our office had mailed it to the wrong address because they, the government just updated the addresses, they'll uh, ask us to provide that letter. Yeah. Interestingly, John, I don't think I've, I don't think they do that I, I, with asylum. I haven't noticed. I've never seen it with asylum. Neither oh, really? As an officer, okay. Nor, yeah, well, I don't, now as, uh, as a yeah. lawyer. That's weird. You, yeah. But in every other context that I'm aware okay. of, they do. I don't know why they don't in asylum. Good to know. Well, I, clearly it shows I don't, we don't handle affirmative asylum cases and, that's why, Brian, you're the man for that. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Ready for my next one? Yes, go ahead, please. All right. So another, uh, this would be the third rejection reason for why asylum applications get sent back. And this has to do with your passport photo. So this is one of the applications that requires that you send a passport photo, right? And what happens is either A, people just forget to send in a passport photo, okay? Um, and that will get it rejected. Or they'll send in a passport photo that the government knows was taken more than 30 days ago. Here's the thing. The application, the, the instructions for the asylum application form say that your photo has to have been taken within the last 30 days of the time that the government receives your application. You may be thinking, well, how would they ever know that someone is sending in a photo that's more than 30 days ago? Like there's no timestamp on the back or anything, right? It's just a little, you know, passport card paper. Um, well, what happens is in the scenario we've been talking about where someone gets their application rejected, um, they'll use a photo and then maybe two months later when they apply again, they'll send in the same photo, the exact same photo. And the government actually sometimes sees that and knows. They say, you sent in the same photo last time and that was two months ago. Therefore, we know that you did not send take this photo with your current attempt within the last 30 days and that, that that happens they actually get they get people on that one unbelievable my wife just found a passport size photo from like 10 years ago she looks exactly like, almost the same <laughs> <laughs> that's great so that's a really good pro tip right there brian we appreciate it thanks man um, who, who would have known yeah 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 what you got next for us about. so next uh number four is not sending the right amount of copies of your application packet so it's not enough just to send your application form and the supporting documents that you want to send with it. You also have to send a copy, like a full like a copy of it, right? And people often forget to do that. They just, they just send one version of it and it gets rejected. Also for family members, you have to send in for each family member that you're claiming as a, what's called a dependent, someone who's like part of your case, um, they have to have a copy as well. So, you know, a person with three family members, um, is going to send in five packets or five, you know, basic five, five, yeah, five application packets. One they call the original for themselves, a copy for themselves, and then one copy for each of their family members. So right. um, that's something that trips people up a lot is not sending the right amount of copies in. So Brian, something like this, would it be similar? Like if the original filing in that kind of situation met the one year deadline, but then it got rejected, do you think that would be covered? To yeah. preserve the one year? Yeah. Anything that is considered like a, yeah, really any reason for a rejection, doesn't matter what it is. If USCIS received that filing attempt before you hit the one year mark, um, they'll they'll forgive it and, and say it was timely. And they'll, they'll, they'll actually use that date. It's not technically the date on which they consider to have received your application. That date is whatever you end up successfully submitting it. But for per when the asylum officer um, is deciding your case, they always do, they have to address this issue of whether the person filed timely, filed within one year. And they'll say, they actually say something like in their little write-up that they have to do after every case, they'll say, the application was not timely. However, the applicant attempted a submission and was rejected under USCIS policy. We use that prior date 
And under that date, it would be considered timely. So friends, as you heard Brian share those t uh, top tips, I think you might have one more, but this is a good, really serious reminder what, why you need to at least have a consultation with a lawyer. I mean, most lawyers don't like to give little tips like this because they wanna help you all the way through, right? From start to finish, like our office does. But if you can afford it, please consider hiring a lawyer. Please do not talk to like an immigration consultant or notario, notary or paralegal in your own um, ethnic community. Uh, please speak with an experienced lawyer like Brian Manning for your asylum application. Aside from these minor little mistakes that could derail your case. Well, it should not derail your case is what I mean, because you don't want to give up. And I think, like you said, Brian, a lot of people give up because they don't know exactly what the rejection letter means. Yeah. Happens all the time. Last one um, is has to do with using the wrong application form. May sound simple, but there's two things that people do, two, two small little errors that happen all the time in this sense. And those are one, they'll use either like an old version of the form because USCIS is constantly updating its forms, making little changes. And if you send in one that is the old, like a prior version, they'll reject it. They'll send it back to you and say, this is not the current version of the form. Um, or I've even seen people send in like unofficial versions of the form, which is to say they'll find online some, you know, fake someone who's acting kind of like in, in the role of an immigration lawyer, but who's not really one uh, or on some, you know, translation website or wherever, some chat group, um, a form that someone has made that's like the asylum application, but it's not the actual asylum application. It's not the one that USCIS has issued. It's something someone did on the, their own. Right. I've seen people send that in before. And it, sometimes they look almost exactly the same, but there's just a little tweak that's different that USCIS notices. And they're like, this isn't the application form. Try again. Right. So to that end, John, you got to go to the website. Um, every time that, even as uh, now as a lawyer still, every time that I um, am working with an asylum application for a client, for that client, go to the USCIS website and get the form off of the asylum page. If you just Google USCIS asylum, you the top link will be the one that takes you to their main asylum information page. And on that one, on that page, there'll be a link that says like, asylum form it's called form i-589 that's click on that link it'll open up the pdf that is the current version of the form um, that's right. that's the safest way to do it that's right friends brian that was another last tip that was a wonderful tip make sure if you go to uh, you're looking for that that form 589 for asylum uh, application or just looking for instructions make sure is that period gov website uscs.gov and um, Brian, I know you have a, a lot of information tips that you can share, but we'll, we'll reserve that for next time. And friends, okay. um, or Brian, can you tell us the best way to contact you? My website is manningasylumlaw.com um, or, you know, maybe a direct direct message through Facebook or Instagram. Um, my handle is at Manning Asylum Law. Um, you can find me at Manning Asylum Law on both Facebook and Instagram. My YouTube page is also called Manning Asylum Law. Uh, well, Brian, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, John. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a good one.